So the talk will be on multimodal cardiomegaly classification with image-derived digital biomarkers. Yeah. And it's from the uh, group in Oxford. Yes, and the slides are on. And our um, presenter will be Benjamin Duizard. Yes. Very welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as the chair said, my name is Ben Duvisart. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the integration of uh, image-derived digital biomarkers into a multimodal framework to then classify cardiomegaly samples. So a little bit of background on cardiomegaly first. Uh, cardiomegaly is an abnormal enlargement of the heart. It's associated with a lot of different cardiac um, pathologies and is even an indicator of higher short-term mortality rate. So the current clinical uh, diagnostic pathway for cardiomegaly is multimodal. A patient will usually have a posterior anterior chest x-ray from which the uh, radiologist can then extract the cardiothoracic ratio. Cardiothoracic ratio being defined as the ratio of the cardiac width, shown in red, to the thoracic width, shown in blue. Usually a CTR or cardiothoracic ratio, CTR over 0.5 is a major indicator of cardiomegaly. Um, and despite the diagnosis being primarily imaging based, there are, uh, it is multimodal. And so the, the clinician will look at all the non-imaging information available about that patient. And then uh, just to get a more wholesome and, and precise diagnosis. So that leads us well into what our actual aims are for the project. We have three main aims. Firstly, to define uh, clinically relevant cardio, uh, image-derived digital biomarkers in the context of cardiomegaly then uh, develop methods to reliably extract those, and then integrate those within a multimodal framework to uh, really just imitate the actual clinical diagnostic pathway. Um, so the two biomarkers that we've uh, ended up using are firstly the CTR, the cardiothoracic ratio. This is the classical um, uh, biomarker, but instead of using the thoracic width, we are using the pulmonary width. This is because just the pulmonary width is significantly easier to extract from a, uh, for, from a chest x-ray, as well as the abundance of lung segmentations uh, available online. Um, the second, and so we, ex we extract this, sorry, through detection, where we're going to find the bounding box for the cardiac, uh, for the cardiac shadow and the bounding box for the lungs, and then we compare the ratio of the two widths. Um, we're also going to use the cardiopulmonary area ratio, or CPAR. This is a novel biomarker, which we've developed in-house during, the, um, during the, the project. And basically here, what we look at is the ratio of the cardiac area to the pulmonary area. And what this allows us to do is that we're using a two-dimensional view of cardiac enlargement compared to the classical one-dimensional. We're going to be looking at uh, this through segmentation. So the cardiac shadow is shaded in red on the image. And then the pulmonary shadow is, uh, this pulmonary segmentation is shown shaded in blue. Um, so to extract the, to develop the detection and segmentation networks needed for, to extract the uh, biomarkers, we use the CTR data set. The CTR data set is an imaging only data set containing 585 chest x-rays sourced from three different databases. Um, we also have uh, each for each of those, sorry, for each of those images, we then have heart and lung segmentations of which uh, 200 lung segmentations were made in-house and 333 heart segmentations were made in-house. These were verified by an NHS clinician before being used for any sort of uh, application. So then for the cardiomegaly classification, we use a completely independent data set. This is the cardiomegaly data set, and it contains 2,774 samples. Uh, these are multimodal. The non-imaging information is extracted from MIMIC-4, which contains patient metadata, lab results, as well as vital signs. We then also use, um, we associate the, sorry, the non-imaging data from an ICU stay to an imaging study, which is taken from MIMIC-4. And from that, we get the images as well as a cardiomegaly label, which is extracted from radiology reports. And so we basically, we just try to match an ICU state to the closest imaging study within a certain window to then create our multimodal sample. So we use two primary models to extract the biomarkers. We use uh, an instant segmentation network. That's the mask RCNN. Uh, we, it has two output modules, the mask RCNN. It has a segmentation output and then as well as an object detection output. Um, and we're gonna use the segmentation output 
From those masks, we do binary uh, alt thresholding to get a binary mask. From that, we can get firstly our CTR ratio, sorry, our CPAR ratio. And then from the binary masks, we also extract bounding boxes to have in another modality to get CTR. We also use a faster CNN. This is an object detection only network. And from that, obviously, we only use that to get the CTR. We use two further models to extract CTR. We use a best score ensemble model where we look at the output from the mask CNN and the faster CNN. And then we take the model with the highest confidence rating. Uh, and then we do a, also an average ensemble model where we're looking at um, basically we take the out bounding box from the mask CNN, the bounding box from the faster CNN, and then we take a pointwise average of the corner coordinates of the bounding boxes. Um, so here are the results of the different um, different methods to extract the CTR and CPAR. For the bounding boxes, we're using an intersection over union score and then a mean average precision with averaged over uh, IOU thresholds at 0.75, 85, and 95, um, where this is different from the segmentation mask where we're using a dice score. But then again, uh, mean average precision with dice threshold at 75, 85, and 95. For the heart model, uh, for the cardiac bounding boxes, the most performant model was the best score ensemble model with an IOU of 0 0.836 uh, compared to the pulmonary bounding boxes, which got a, which had a most performant model was an average ensemble model with an IOU of 0 0.908. The big performance delta between uh, the uh, cardiac bounding boxes and then the pulmonary bounding boxes is attributed mostly to the fact that lungs have a much higher contrast ratio on an x-ray and so just significantly easier to extract, whereas a, a heart will actually just melt into, um, some of the boundaries of the heart can be, uh, can melt into the background tissue. Uh, this is also seen in the segmentation masks where the pulmonary segmentation masks have a much higher segmentation uh, dice score of 0 0.937 compared to 0 0.908 for the cardiac uh, segmentation masks. So moving forward to extract CPAR, we're using the segmentation model. And then for the um, for the sorry for the CTR, we're using the best score uh, cardiac bounding boxes and average ensemble uh, pulmonary bounding boxes. So this slide really shows our whole data flow for our actual multimodal framework. Um, we start all the way on the image left uh, with our raw data, where we have our images, our time series vital signs, our time series lab data, as well as our patient metadata. Firstly, we're passing the vital signs and lab data through an aggregation block um, to extract um, yeah, summary values. These are then passed into a tabular data format, as well as the one hot encoded uh, metadata. Um, and then looking at the images, we take our images, we pass them through the segmentation block, the detection block through to the CTR block to then extract our CTR values and CPR values for each patient. This also goes then into the tabular data format so that every patient essentially has a one dimensional vector containing all the non-imaging features as well as the two biomarker values. Um, so then to go into the actual classification, uh, what we do is we have two different models for our multimodal classification. Firstly, on the top there, we have our, a, a multimodal model taken from Grant et al. published in uh, MIUA in 2021. Um, this takes our raw, Im our pre-processed images. It passes them through an X-ray feature block, which is essentially the initial layers of a ResNet 50. This outputs then 32 layers worth of, uh, 32 nodes, sorry, worth of features from the images. Then we take our tabular data format. We pass it through a two layer feed forward network which outputs 16 layers, 16 nodes worth of features. These are then concatenated and passed into the joint feature block, which outputs our final classification. It's worth noting here that there is a, uh, the back propagation of the error through the concatenation layer. Um, we then have a secondary model, which uses only our tabular data. And this is directly through an XG boost model. We use two further models for unimodal approaches. Uh, we use a, re a full ResNet 50 for the images only, and then we use an XG boost uh, for the non-imaging only as well. So uh, here are results of all of the many different classifiers we used for cardiomegaly. Uh, the most performant model was our XG boost multimodal model containing I the non-imaging ICU data as well as the biomarker values. 
with an accuracy of 0.8, uh, 82.1% over five folds. Um, but there's a couple of really interesting things here. Firstly, uh, all of the dates, all of the different models, which contain some sorts of imaging values, whether that be raw images or our biomarkers, they all have an accuracy within a range of 1.1%. So that's really, really quite small. And then within that, I want to focus on two specific comparisons. Firstly, the uh, ResNet 50, for ResNet 50 on the images only, and then the XG Boost with the multi biomarkers only. And here, the difference in accuracy is only 0.5%, which is really marginal. And this shows that actually our biomarker values are really performant and are able to ex ex contain basically all of, almost all of the information which ResNet 50 can extract from the images. And this speaks really to the strength of our biomarkers rather than the uh, potential failings of ResNet 50. Uh, the second one I want to focus on is the multimodal compared to the XGBoost multimodal. And what we see here is, again, there's a really small performance delta, but there is a performance delta over five folds. And um, this indicates that maybe actually it's not only a question of what data we use, but also what model we use. And it, again, as uh, one of the introductions uh, presentations said, what we can do with those uh, biomarkers is actually reduce down the high dimensional imaging data into one dimensional uh, uh, data points. And so use an optimized model for that type of data, which gets us better results. So in conclusion, we really have three main conclusions about our uh, biomarkers. And the models we can create based off those biomarkers, they provide three things. They provide a guarantee that the features, uh, that the feature selection is clinically robust. Because we have so much more control over what exactly the model is looking at, we can guarantee that uh, they are clinically relevant to that disease. And it's not just looking in the general area of the heart. We can tell you that it's looking at something very specific. Secondly, that these models provide basically equivalent performance to the black box ResNet 50, for instance, models, but with an improved interpretability. Because those imaging features have a medical interpretation that's really simple and very direct, this will lead to clinical, uh, clinician trust in the model predictions, which in turn will lead to clinical implementation. And then the last one is that, as I mentioned, because we're able to reduce the high dimensional data into one dimensional points, means we can use better and improved multimodal implementations um, which and use more optimized models. I also just wanna quickly mention here uh, that the we extracted CTR and CPA values for all the posterior anterior chest X-rays in MIMIC CXR. Um, that's roughly 96,000 values. Uh, these, as well as the new segment, as the 538 segmentations, they will be published on PhysioNet shortly. Um, so yeah, uh, this is just the quick by, uh, distribution plots of our um, CTR and CPAR values. And they seem to be, they're really encouraging when you compare them to the ground truth distributions. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes. Yes. Tell me what you saw. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that was done uh, firstly for completeness, uh, really, uh, is the reason the main reason why we did it was just for completeness. That way we had the full implementation as well as the multimodal, including both the raw images as well as the biomarkers. And then uh, also what this allows us to show is that there is that the multimodal model, when we compare the two rows of the two different multimodal models, so that's the third row and then the last row, uh, there's actually a performance fall. This could be just random, but it could also be the, the fact that actually we wanted to check that providing those, um, those the ResNet 50 as well as the biomarker values didn't then increase the performance because that would suggest that the ResNet 50 is able to extract more information from the images beyond what just what the biomarker values give. 
for some reason here. I mean, but realistically, it's it's mostly for completeness. But yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? We have time for one fast question. Yes, in the first row. Yes. The conference rating is uh, is already in the, sorry, was this with the ensemble models, this one, right? The best score ensemble model, where we look at the mask or the ResNet 50, uh, so the mask are CNN and the faster are CNN, and we look at the, we take the output with the highest conference rating. We well, it's it's integrated within the within Mask or CNN. It will output um, a, a conference rating, and Fast CNN will also output a conference rating. So we use those that are already integrated within the models. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. Our next talk is again from the University of Oxford. It's on proton density fat fraction of breast adipose tissue, comparison of the effect of fat spectra and initial evaluation as a biomarker. And our speaker is Isabel Gordon. Welcome on stage. Hi, thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's such a privilege to be able to speak here today. What role does mammary fat have to play in breast cancer? Can we visualize changes to it without the need for biopsy? What is the point of measuring the fat fraction of fatty tissue? Today, I hope to answer some of those questions and introduce a novel quantitative biomarker that could have use in the detection of early stage breast cancer. One in every seven women in the UK will now be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. And that figure just unfortunately continues to rise with diagnoses increasing by 34% before 2040. Early detection greatly improves prognosis, which is why the UK employs the regular screening of asymptomatic women. Mammography is used for this screening, but unfortunately its effectiveness is dramatically reduced in so-called dense breasts, which have a high portion of fibrous tissue compared to fatty tissue. Around half of postmenopausal women and most premenopausal women are classed as having dense breasts. For these women, dynamic contrast enhanced MRI is increasingly employed as an alternative imaging technique. The use of contrast agent that has to be injected into the patient for this scan tends to dominate the imaging time and interpretation of results is often semi-quantitative, relying on operators' experience. In general, research to date has focused on directing tumours directly rather than on measuring characteristics of the whole breast parenchyma. We think that characterizing the breast parenchyma with MRI could provide a great opportunity to improve the detection of cancer and more broadly improve assessment of whole breast health. Over the last four decades, research has thrown out the idea of the adipose tissue of, as being an inert energy story depot and has actually come to recognize fat as a complex endocrine system. In fact, growth factors secreted by adipose tissue in the breast have been shown to promote tumour angiogenesis and actually to even affect treatment efficacy. The adipose organ has a high degree of plasticity, that is the ability to differentiate characteristics according to its environment. Adipose tissue can generally be classified into two different subtypes. Brown adipose tissue, which is primarily used for heat generation, and white adipose tissue, which is primarily used for energy storage. White adipocytes can actually differentiate into brown-like adipocytes in a process referred to as browning. Importantly, breast cancer tumour growth has actually been associated with the browning of mammary fat close to the tumour. Furthermore, the brown adipose activity has been shown to be three times higher in patients with breast cancer specifically. Further changes to the breast adipose tissue during cancer include inflammation, which has been associated with both invasive and non-invasive subtypes of cancer, and edema, which has been associated around invasive cancer. Proton density fat fraction, or PDFF, is a useful measurement of tissue fat concentration. It's an entirely non-invasive quantitative biomarker, and it's been extensively used in the diagnosis, staging, and monitoring of fatty liver disease. It's also shown to be highly reproducible and robust to artifacts. 
brown adipose PDFF has actually been uh, shown to be significantly lower than white adipose PDFF. That's related to its lower lipid content and higher intracellular water content. The presence of inflammation and edema would only further lower PDFF measurement in breast adipose tissue. We therefore hypothesized that lower PDFF in breast adipose tissue could be associated with the browning and inflammation of mammary fat. This lowering of PDFF could be um, specifically located in certain regions, possibly helping with tumor detection, or it could be spread throughout the breast, possibly influencing assessment of breast cancer risk. In recent work by Hisanaga et al, the PDFF was found to be lowered around um, the region surrounding invasive cancer, and it was actually linked to the degree of metastasis into the lymph nodes. The MR sequence that they used for this work was Ideal IQ, which is a manufacturer specific MR sequence that's been specialized for use in the liver. A breast specific calculation of PDFF has not yet been explored, and non invasive breast cancer has not yet been examined in this context. Multi echo chemical shift encoded MRI is typically used for the calculation of PDFF. And what that does is exploits the difference in precession frequencies between water and fat. The calculation of PDFF aims to solve this equation here um, for the complex valued MR signal at each different echo time, which is denoted by the index I. Rho W and Rho F, those first two terms, are the um, proton counts for fat and water, respectively, and that's what we're aiming to solve. They remain constant throughout the different echo times. Most CSE MRI techniques are complex based in that they use both the magnitude and phase components of the MR signal. However, this complex approach can introduce fat water swap artifacts and phase information may not be readily available in a routine clinical setting. Recent work by Bagur et al introduced a magnitude based approach for quantification of PDFF, which is shown to be more robust. Um, essentially what that does is disregards this complex term in the equation. One input required for calculation of PDFF is actually an MR spectrum of fat, which is highlighted here. Fat spectra have a composite nature consisting of multiple different peaks, which represent the slightly different environments of the hydrogen mo mo uh, molecules in the hydrogen atoms in the triglyceride molecules. Use of a multi-peak spectral model has been shown to be crucial for accurate quantification of PDFF. It's often assumed that the difference that fat spectra make in quantification of PDFF, particularly in the liver, is minimal. However, the choice of fat spectrum is shown to be increasingly important at higher PDFF values. The only spectra thus far used in quantification of PDFF in the breast have been a liver fat spectrum, as I previously mentioned, and a subcutaneous fat spectrum, which was used to um, assess the measurement of PDFF as a measure of breast density. So our research aims to answer two core questions. Firstly, does using a breast specific fat spectrum in the calculation of breast adipose PDFF improve the goodness of fit to the signal model? And secondly, do we see a reduction in the PDFF of adipose tissue around not only invasive breast cancer, but also non-invasive subtypes? We wanted to examine the PDFF also around benign breast lesions to ensure that any reduction in PDFF we were seeing wasn't just influenced by an imaging artifact at the boundary between different tissue types. Breast adipose MR spectral data was provided by researchers at New York University. And we analyzed two different spectra, one from breast adipose tissue of a healthy woman and one from a woman with breast cancer. We fit a spectral model consisting of um, 10 different Lorentzian peaks and a linear baseline to the spectral data. Participants were scanned as part of the Imogen study, which is a large scale study which is going to um, ultimately recruit over a thousand women and assess the performance of non contrast multiparametric MRI in breast cancer diagnosis. 46 female volunteers were imaged in total on a Siemens Era 1.5T MR scanner. 42 of those were healthy, two of those had breast cysts but were otherwise healthy. One person had ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a non-invasive type of breast cancer, and one person had invasive breast cancer. The MR protocol included a 3D axial six echo gradient echo um, CSE MRI acquisition, which is used for the quantification of PDFF. And then we also just acquired a standard T1 weighted sequence score anatomical reference. 
PDFF maps were processed using the magnitude only approach that I previously mentioned, and the PDFF maps were generated five different times, each time using a different fat spectrum. This included the two spectra from breast fat that we analyzed, two spectra taken from subcutaneous fat, and then also a spectrum taken from liver fat. To segment all the adipose tissue in the breast, we first used a morphology-based approach to um, find a whole breast segmentation as demonstrated here. We then used a two-pronged method to try and segment out the adipose tissue from the fibrous tissue within the breast, which is a very heterogeneous structure. Firstly, we used a phase, phase symmetry-based approach, um, which performed quite well at the exclusion of thin strands of fibrous tissue, but it didn't tend to identify larger areas of fibrous tissue very well. Therefore, secondly, to ensure elimination of larger clumps of fibrous tissue, we fit a multimodal Gaussian model to a histogram of all PDFF values in the breast. The three peaks that we identified were um, hypothesized to correspond to voxels containing just fatty tissue, voxels containing just fibrous tissue, and voxels containing a mixture of the two species. A threshold value was found by calculating the three sigma upper bound for the central peak, which is hypothesized to exclude more than 99% of fibrous tissue containing voxels. The mean PDFF value and the mean R squared value was then um, extracted across all the breast adipose tissue segmentation. And for examination of paralegional PDFF, which I'll talk about later, we positioned ROIs manually. Breast adipose PDFF values amongst a healthy cohort did not significantly differ when using a liver fat spectrum compared to using a healthy breast fat spectrum. However, the R squared performance was found to be significantly poorer using this liver fat spectrum. This suggests that whilst the liver fat spectrum may be an acceptable choice, it's probably not the optimal choice of spectrum for this purpose. When we calculated the adipose tissue segmentation individually for each of the PDFF maps calculated with the different fat spectra, a nine peak subcutaneous fat spectrum was actually shown to have the best R squared performance. However, examining that a little bit more closely with manual review, the PDFF maps calculated with this nine peak subcutaneous fat spectrum actually showed the presence of regions like this, where there is artificially lowered PDFF due to poor fitting. Due to the thresholding step in the adipose tissue segmentation, those regions had automatically been excluded from the adipose mask. So they weren't reflected very well in our measurement of R squared. This really emphasized to us the importance of um, the segmentation when assessing model performance in complex heterogeneous structures like the breast. We therefore chose to apply the same adipose tissue mask to all the different PDFF maps calculated with the different fat spectra. And this segmentation was um, manually reviewed against the high resolution T1 weighted images. Applying the same segmentation, we found that the goodness of fit with a healthy breast fat spectrum was actually um, significantly better than using this nine peak subcutaneous fat spectrum. We now wanted to just kind of take a step back and look more generally at the PDFF values that we were getting in a healthy cohort. We found that the PDFF of healthy breast fat and the PDFF of gluteal fat measured by a separate study were similar with values of 91.6% and 90.8% respectively. This suggests a similar composition between the two adipose types, which is consistent with literature regarding them both as largely consisting of white adipose tissue. The calculation of this reference value of mammary PDFF amongst a healthy cohort could have future use um, to compare pathology against. Bland Altman analysis showed high reproducibility between left and right breast adipose PDFF with a bias of just 0.57% which really solidified the um, reputation of PDFF as a highly reproducible quantitative biomarker. Adipose tissue PDFF was actually found to be lowered in the regions immediately surrounding both invasive and non-invasive cancer compared to the rest of the adipose tissue. A mean reduction of 4.5% was found around non-invasive cancer and a mean reduction of 5.6% was observed around invasive cancer. The PDFF reduction around both types of cancer was distinctly larger than the reduction we saw around cysts, which was just 0.4%, which reduces the likelihood that any PDFF reduction is just caused by an artifact. The reduction in PDFF was, of course, greatest in proximity to invasive cancer, which potentially suggests the utility of looking at the magnitude of this PDFF reduction to measure the extent of the disease. So what overall conclusions can we make from this work? 
Well, firstly, we found that the use of breast-specific fat spectrum significantly improved the goodness of fit in breast adipose PDFF calculation compared to other previously implemented fat spectra. Whilst R squared is, of course, not a definitive metric of um, the accuracy of PDFF calculation, which is impossible without histological measurement of fat content, it is definitely a measurement of um, how well the signal model fits to the data. And so an improved value in that is certainly promising. Secondly, we found that the readily available liver spectrum does have potential utility in the measurement of breast adipose PDFF. And finally, we found that localized regions of distinctly lowered adipose PDFF were observed around both invasive and non-invasive breast cancer, which we think could be indicative of the browning and inflammation of mammary fat. The fact that they, these regions weren't observed in proximity to cysts does suggest that this is reflective of a physiological change. We believe that breast adipose PDFF has shown potential utility as a non-invasive quantitative biomarker for both types of invasive and non-invasive cancer. The identification of localized regions of lowered PDFF could help with the detection of tumors and analysis of the magnitude of PDFF production could help with disease characterization. PDFF may also have broad utility as um, a metric of breast tissue characterization to enable assessment of whole breast health and possibly influence breast cancer risk through measurement of adipocyte inflammation, which has been linked to obesity and brown tissue activity. The continuation of the Imogen study will enable us to further assess PDFF as a novel biomarker across a larger and more varied patient cohort and assess its use as part of a multi-parametric tool to quantify breast health. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, love to hear any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. So we again have five minutes for questions. Are there any questions in the audience? There's a couple of them. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you for the great talk. Um, so we all know that the breast cancer, we have like various kinds of breast cancer that are right. there and uh, which which will, I guess it will affect, I mean, we know microscopically they, they are very different, but I don't know how much different they are in, in a, uh, I mean, this kind of modality of images that you're working with. So what my question is, it's based on your data set, it mm. seems that you only have one cancerous case in your data set, which does not represent the variation that you might see. Right. Uh, and also not, not the variation in the cancer types, but also the variation that you might see with the patients. So is there any like clinical uh, justification for, for, for this to include just one, only one yeah. cancer case? Yeah, absolutely. So the data we used was part of this study called the Imogen study. And so it's ongoing. Um, but the way that we recruit is through um, women who have been referred to a secondary care breast clinic. So they may or may not have breast cancer and then we get their diagnosis later. So, yeah, for this work, we had two cancer cases, a non-invasive cancer case and an invasive cancer case. But um, with the rollout of the Imogen study, we're hoping to get definitely more cancer cases. We're actually now making an amendment to that study to basically for the purpose that you said to actually recruit people with confirmed cancer cases. The difficulty then is that you get um, they will have had their lesions biopsied. So regions. So if you see, for example, a lowering in PDFF, that could be due to like bi edema from biopsy. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, it'll be great to get more cancer data sets. And I completely appreciate what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this might be a bit of a general question since I don't know I don't know much at all about breast cancer. But could you talk about what you know, how is invasive different from non-invasive, and can you tell which is which by your PDFF uh, measurements? Yeah. Um. So I'm also you know not a biologist. I'm sure there's people who know a lot more about this than I do, but. My understanding in non-invasive breast cancer, the cancer has really, so for example, in ductal carcinoma in situ, the cancer is still contained within the ducts. So it's not actually spread and burst out from the ducts and metastasized into the breast. In invasive cancer, there's actually an invasive front that pushes through to the breast, um, through, through the breast organ, and it can actually, yeah, spread to other parts of the body. Um, 
I think it's probably too early stage to say that we can definitely determine between non-invasive and invasive cancer with this measurement, but we did see that the reduction in PDFF around non-invasive cancer was lower than the reduction that we saw around um, invasive cancer, which kind of makes sense in that right, with invasive cancer, you'd expect that more browning, more inflammation, and so on. So, But obviously, yeah, we've only got a handful of cases at the moment, but it would be really interesting to see if that holds true. Thanks. That was so interesting. Thanks so much. I was just curious to ask more about like the MRI parameters. Yeah. So would having more fibrous breasts affect the PDFF and chemical shift of your measurements? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so oh, my slide's gone, but there was there was an image of like a bunch of different um, PDFF cases there and you could PDFF maps there and you can really see quite a variation in the amounts of fibrous and fatty tissue, just, just in terms of like just showing the variety of a patient cohort that we had. We didn't um, look for a specific link between fibrous tissue, um, like breast density and PDFF. Theoretically, it shouldn't make a difference. What would make a difference is actually the spreading, like how the fibrous tissue is distributed. I feel like if you have these little strands of fibrous tissue, then you're more likely to get the inclusion of those in your adipose um, tissue voxels, if you know what I mean. Um, so I feel like that could definitely play in, into this. But we didn't look for a specific link in this case. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a really interesting idea. Um, at this point, we don't know. All we know is that we're seeing a reduction and we have yeah a few hypotheses as to what that could be caused by. Um, I think, yeah, with, with future work, um, if we, uh, we might be able to get our hands on some histology data, then that would really help us out with this. Thanks. Fantastic. So I think more questions can be answered in the um, coffee break in 20 minutes. So yeah, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker will be from the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And the talk will be on revisiting the shape bias of deep learning for demoscopic skin lesion classification. Fantastic. Welcome, Adriano Lutieri. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you and welcome to all. As was mentioned, my name is Adriano Lutieri. I'm from the German, Re I'm a PhD student at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence and TU Kaiserslautern. And today I will introduce you to the shape bias, tell you um, the shape bias in deep learning, tell you what the shape bias is, and we will investigate the influence or how the shape bias can or cannot improve thermoscopic skin lesion classification. And for that, we will start with a graphical example. One second. Yes, so in this image, you can see a cat. It uh, has all the necessary characteristics of a cat. It has fur, it has whiskers and pointy ears. On the next image, you can also see a cat, but this cat does not have fur. It has wrinkly skin. And on this last image, you can see a patch where you can see fur, which could be attributed to a cat, but actually this picture shows a carpet. So you yes. can see that even a task as simple as yeah, classifying a cat um, combines different characteristics, but the human visual system relies heavily on the shape, which makes sense in that case. Um, but as you will now see for, um, yeah, for, neural networks, this is not always the case. So um, there was a recent study from Giros et al, where they yeah, realized that if you show a CNN, a picture of a cat, it will correctly classify it as a cat and the skin of elephants also as elephants. But if you transfer the style from the elephant skin to the cat image, then the network gets confused. As a human, you would look at the image, you would recognize the shape of the cat and you would clearly say that this is a cat image and you would not really recognize the resemblance with the elephant skin. Um, and this phenomenon is called as the texture bias. Um, and from, that, uh, from, from this uh, finding, there were a lot of um, 
yeah, methods developed to basically shift neural networks from uh, working as texture texture biased models models to working as shape biased models. So basically aligning the inner workings of the networks to the way the visual human recognition system works. Um, but what now about complex medical imaging tasks? So in dermoscopic skin lesion classification, for example, we have a very important distinction between malignant melanomas and benign nevi. And the way doctors usually uh, go about to solve this problem is they try to detect a different row of dermoscopic characteristics, dermoscopic concepts, um, to get a bigger, broader picture, and then try to use intuition and analytical reasoning to get to an informed decision. Um, these different dermoscopic concepts can be grouped in broader feature groups, like, for example, texture, shape, and color. And texture usually refers to the pigmentation structure um, visible on the skin lesion. So for melanoma, um, this pigmentation structure is rather irregular and um, yeah, asymmetric. For benign nevi, it is more consistent. Then for shape, shape refers to the outline of the skin lesion area which is more asymmetric in melanoma and more symmetric in nevi. And color refers to the number and types of colors visible in the skin lesion. Um, yeah, so what does this have to do with shape bias then? So um, the literature showed that CNNs can work as pattern recognition systems, so work as texture, texture bias models, but as well as object recognition systems with a shape bias. And the main important factor to decide whether they work texture biased or shape biased is the training data. Um, and there has been a lot of different work trying to enforce shape bias onto CNNs to make them more performant and also more robust. But in our work, we claim that this is not, uh, not a necessary requirement for most medical imaging tasks. We say that the non-functional requ requirements, sorry, um, to solve a medical imaging task. So basically the classification strategy um, is or cannot always be well-defined. So um, it requires a bit more beyond the shape bias to improve those models. And for that, in our work, we try to tackle three different questions. The first question is we wanted to know whether CNNs um, do use the same features, so the texture, shape, and the color as humans do. And then we wanted to see where these features are, lo are located in the spectral domain. So whether they are um, encoded more in the amplitude spectrum or the phase spectrum. And then lastly, we wanted to see if we can use this information to, um, yeah, to develop a method to improve skin lesion classification. Um, for that, first we tried to define and yeah, to define texture, shape, and color um, using the previous work from the literature, and also to define some ablations to isolate these features from the images and also remove them. Um, so in the first case for texture, um, we isolated the texture by um, first removing the color by converting the image into a sketch drawing to um, highlight the fine edges and outlines visible on the image. And then we removed the shape by um, yeah, applying a jigsaw puzzle scheme. So um, first to basically exclude all information about the lesion borders, about the regularity or irregularity of the border by removing all patches which contain in lesion and out lesion information. And also we applied equal sampling to have as many samples from within the lesion area and outside of the lesion area to remove all the information about the size of the skin lesion. We removed the texture by using um, a skin lesion segmentation algorithm um, and sc scrambling all the pixels within the lesion area. So scrambling the textures, but keeping the color and also respectively on the outside of the skin lesion. Um, for shape, we simply isolate the shape by using the lesion segmentations as well. Um, and we removed the shape by again, applying the jigsaw puzzle scheme but this time keeping the color without the sketch transformation. And for color isolation, we basically scrambled all the pic pixels spatially and we removed the color by just applying the sketch transformation. So here you can see the overview of the ablations that we created and we used several different data sets. So two data sets for skin lesion analysis 
namely, namely Derm 7 point and ISIC archive. Um, and apart from that, we also used two visual recognition data sets, which are both subsets of ImageNet called ImageNet and ImageWoo, and both um, contain 10 different classes from ImageNet. So the first question that we tackled was um, to see basically if CNNs use the same features as humans. And for that, we used the original training data sets for skin lesions, um, derived different subsets with the different ablations that we just discussed, and we trained different or individual instances of CNNs with each of these data sets. And now we also report the um, evaluation with the respective test sets. So as you can see here, um, we have different aspects, um, but I want to highlight some. So this is the macro average F1 scores of the models both trained and tested on these respective ablation data sets. And you can see that um, all the isolation settings um, achieved a, or F1 scores above the random baseline. And also in the combined cases where you have um, sets of two features left, um, these are usually higher than only single features. From the isolation experiments, you can also clearly see that color is always or seems to be the most important feature of these three features that we um, saw. And interestingly, you can see that the networks trained on ISIC data set seem to have a slight bias towards texture, whereas the germ 7 point data set trained networks have a slight bias towards the shape. Um, now we wanted to see whether the networks, the normal baseline networks trained on unablated data, learn these features in isolation or as entangled features. So for that, we used the baseline data set trained a CNN again, but then we tested on the different ablation data sets to see how much information the baseline network can pick up from these data. Um, as we can see here, again, we have the macro average F1 scores. Um, the baseline data set uh, or the network trained on the baseline data set is actually not really able to pick up any information from, um, yeah, from the ablated test sets. Um, we thought that this might also be partly due to the domain shift that you have between the data sets. So we also tried the inverse case. And in the inverse case, you see that actually the networks trained on the ablated data and tested on the original data um, can pick up a lot more information. So we basically concluded from that, that the network learns entangled information. The next question was um, whether we were would be able to recover this information from the feature extractor. And for that, we used a method called deep feature reweighting. The idea here is that um, the entanglement takes actually place only in the last classification layer of the network and not in the feature extractor. So the idea is to train the CNN again, but then retrain only the final classification layer using the train sets of the ablated data sets, and then again, test on the ablated data. And here you can see a comparison of the macro average F1 scores again, um, before and after deep feature reweighting in red and blue. And the yellow bars indicate the maximum performance achieved when you trained the network directly on the ablated train sets. And you can see here that deep feature reweighting is actually able to recover single features to a very good degree in many cases, um, which indicates that the features are sufficiently encoded um, and disentangled in the feature extractor. So the next um, thing that we had a look at was um, where these features are encoded in the spatial domain, uh, in the spectral domain, sorry. Um, and for that, a short introduction to the discrete Fourier transform or DFT. Um, the DFT is basically a mathematical operation which allows to represent a signal, in this case, an image, um, as a decomposition of frequencies. So it allows us to divide a signal into an amplitude space or amplitude spectrum and phase spectrum. And to get a better intuition of what these spectra encode, um, we can see the cases where phase or amplitude are removed. And then we uh, look at the reconstruction. So in the upper case, if we remove the phase, you can see that only color information is left, but almost no information about the spatial features. If we, on the other hand, remove the amplitude information, we can see that um, it's clearly vis visible where the spatial features are located. You can see fine edges and outlines. 
Um, here you can see the test results from the baseline networks and networks trained only on phase removed data and amplitude removed data. Um, the gray areas show the relative decrease in performance from the baseline score and a higher drop for phase removed um, or yeah, yeah, for phase removed means that the phase domain would carry more information. Um, I want to highlight two things. So the first thing is that the randomization of either um, yeah, phase or amplitude leads to comparable impact for the skin lesion cases. And except for one case, all the cases um, result in a slightly higher drop when removing the phase. And the drop when removing the amplitude is always considerably high. When we look at the visual recognition data sets in comparison, we see that there is a heavy shape bias. For example, for ImageNet, um, the amplitude removal results in 5% decrease, but phase removal results in almost 50% decrease. Um, yeah, now we wanted to look um, if we can enforce a disentanglement of these spectral features during the training. And for that, let me introduce you to the amplitude phase recombination method or APR. The idea of APR is basically to augment the input data to uh, by, by randomly replacing the amplitude to force the network to um, yeah, um, yeah, pick up these phase features. So uh, first you select two images and you compute the DFT. And in that space, you uh, recombine the phase and amplitude. So you mix up these um, spectra and reconstruct the image to then pick the phase label to um, uh, use these images to train the network. We learned that color is very important for skin lesion classification. So we introduced amplitude focused APR, where similarly to APR, we used um, to align the labels with respect to the amplitude spectra of the images. And we also tried mixed APR where we sampled randomly whether to use APR or amplitude focused APR. And here you can see the results, um, the test accuracies for different APR augmentations. Um, and you can see that amplitude focused APR actually successfully improved the two binary skin lesion cases and mixed APR did not lead to significant improvements. And for the visual recognition case, you can surprisingly see that APR, APR did not improve um, the visual recognition data set performance significantly, but you can see that AF APR and mixed APR decrease the performance of these visual recognition data sets. So what did we learn from that? Um, first, we can answer the question of CNNs using texture, shape, and color with, yes, they use texture, shape, and color. Um, we've also seen that whether they are texture, texture based or shape, shape biased, sorry, um, depends on the training data set. And we also learned that color is always very important for skin lesion classification. Um, then we have seen that networks learn entangled representations, but this representation can also be recovered in the feature extractor. Um, and features are spread over both amplitude and phase domain as compared to visual recognition, where it is only focused on phase domain. And lastly, we can see that AFAPR can, in some cases, increase the performance of binary skin lesion classification settings. So those are the references, and thank you for your time. I'm happy to thank you. Thank you for this interesting talk. I think we have time for one or two quick questions before we go into the first coffee break. Are there any questions in the audience? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, no, we did focus only on dermoscopic skin lesion classification, but we will or we plan to um, yeah extend this work also on other imaging tasks. Any other questions? Thanks for the talk. I'm just wondering, so what if people have like different color skin? Does your neural network get a bit confused by that? Can you... Does your neural network get confused if people have different color skin? Um, 
we didn't real uh, recognize this in this work, but definitely that's the case. Uh, there, there is also a study which shows that different skin colors yield different performances in train networks. So that's a problem. So if there are no other questions in the audience, I would say we wrap up the first um, session. Let's thank all of the speakers again. And we do have half of an hour coffee break. And next session starts at 11. Thank you all.